I wanted to welcome everybody to the first Reflection Friday uh, of the semester. Um, thank you so much for Elizabeth for coming. Um, just wanted to do a little rundown of the next few Reflection Fridays. So uh, March 18th is going to be a Reflection Friday with Gabby Fuentes, who is a CSE Fellow. Um, on April 8th we'll have Nadia Horning. Um, the 22nd, we'll have the Banjan, who's also a fellow. The 29th of April, we'll have Linda Schiffer, who is Cook Commons coordinator. And then on the 6th, or in the final, uh, on May 6th, we'll have our final Reflection Friday. And it'll be with Sarah Jones, who's also a CSE fellow. Um, so I just wanted to, again, welcome Elizabeth. Uh, my name is Dan. I'm a sophomore. Um, and I work with Elizabeth. Um, I worked with her this past summer um, as a Shepherd Poverty intern at the at John Graham Housing Services, um, which is a homeless shelter in Bridgens that also operates four other buildings um, that are transitional housing units, and they provide services um, to families who are homeless or are struggling to make ends meet. Um, and Elizabeth, prior to being the executive director of um, John Graham Shelter, or John Graham Housing and Services, which used to be John Graham Shelter, um, was a senator um, in Addison County for 16 years? 16 years. Um, and then she was the state auditor of Vermont for three years, and she was described as a progressive force to be reckoned with. Um, and I just wanted to welcome you again um, and start off with the question, which is the theme this past year, um, with what the CSE has been doing. Um, so what matters to you and why? Okay, um, I think what matters to me, obviously, you know, you think about justice. Justice matters to me, that people get a fair shape. People are treated with decency and respect. Um, it matters to me that um, people have some care in their lives, um, that they have some safety, and that they feel that they belong. They belong somewhere, and that they're not—they're uh, not other. They're not um, pushed aside. That everybody has a place here in this on this earth, in this world, in this community where they find themselves. And so, you know, when I was—I uh, tried to talk about this in, in a TED talk earlier this year, and I think I'm across. Especially well, I didn't think. But you know, you try in a lot of ways. You, you have these impulses about how to do this, and obviously, there's you know, we're having a huge national debate about these things right now. You know, um, so, what is community? Who belongs? How do we care for each other? Um, and so, there's all kinds of ways to do it, and sometimes you want to just do it all at once. And so, uh, you know, I first got involved because, you know, in the community when things were happening that I didn't like, and I saw it, and I thought, well, I can do better than this, you know. And so I got involved in politics, and I got elected, and, you know, I worked for Governor Cunin at the time, and, um, you know, we did all, all these, you know, and a lot of it didn't happen, you know, and it's really frustrating because there's always these other forces out here. You know. so, then I started thinking, after many, you know, more than 25 years of this, I started thinking that um, maybe the real way to do it is through just working directly with people, you know, just really being present with somebody. Um, because even if you do, you know, like, okay, let's just take one of the things that's dominating and that, that touches the people that Dan and I work with, um, has to do with housing and benefits. And now we have all these people coming from other places that have no housing and they have no place. They have no place where they can call their own. They've been driven out by war and by economic forces, right? And so they're going in boats and they're going out in the world. And some of them are coming here. Um, and then meanwhile, we have other people here that have been kept down um, to a lot of ways, very low wages, not a lot of uh, ability to have decent incomes. So all these things kind of come to a stoop, even just in our own little organization, you know, because we have people uh, 
you know, mothers <clears throat> with children, people that, don't, that can't get jobs. Um, and so, you know, you think about these things and you think about um, what can you do and so you try to work on a lot of different levels. You know, we try to work on the level of changing policy, public policy, and, and that's, that's a very important thing. And, and then we work on the level of community, trying to build community so that people aren't alone, you know, people do come. You know, whether it's a family coming from Africa or from Syria or, you know, that when they come here, that um, we say, I see, you belong, this is your home. And how you do that is so important. And then there's the individual level of working uh, with the per with an individual person. And um, that's the work of really listening deeply to them, you know, and to what they're saying. And not be waiting for them to finish their sentence so that you can suggest, you know, what the solution is. Uh, but really, you know, and and all of those different levels, you know, the, the macro policy level, whether it's federal or state, the community level, uh, and then the personal level, all of those things, you know, they're, it's almost like a practice, you know. You don't just go in and do it, you know. <laughs> you try and you don't get it quite right, and so you come back to it, you know. And so um, you, just, you just try to make a life of, trying to be present to those values in every single way that you can. So that's what matters to me. Um, and I think the personal level is the hardest level. And it's where the greatest potential change is. And it's a place where we probably don't give it enough credulity. You know what I mean? Like you just, you know, you just, I'm thinking of this family that, that came from Syria. And uh, the father was a dental surgeon, worked for the UN, and the mother taught English, and they had three really bright kids about the age of you guys here in the room. And um, they came here fleeing because they were targeted because the father was doing surgery for people that had been harmed in the war. And, you know, so, they, so they came here, and they came to Vermont. And, uh, you know, of course, you know, she showed me pictures of the dental clinic, you know, it was beautiful, spotless, modern. Kids were engineering students, you know, pre-med, just like you guys, you know, they, whatever they wanted, they would do in Damascus. They came here, you know, the father's working in a gas station. You know, this guy that is, you know, is a surgeon. Um, and so, you know, she just came and she just begged me to get these kids into school. How did they get up to school? They don't speak English very well. And so we tried really hard. Finally, we got two of three into school. The third one is going part time to New Zealand, part time to community college. But then, you know, I went to this dinner um, of people, New Americans, and it was all serious, and it was all their music, and it was all. And I just realized how I hadn't really succeeded in that third thing. You know, because I was always so focused on trying to get the kids into school, trying to get the apartment, trying to, that I didn't really fully listen, you know, to what it was like for her to have lost everything. You know, and you, you think you know what it's like, but you really don't know what it's like. Um, you know, I was thinking, okay, great, you know, now they're in, now they've got an apartment, now they're going to UVM. You know, and I just, always wondered why she was so filled with grief, you know, and they had a good life. And I just realized that I couldn't really understand everything that had been lost. And so on that individual level, I hadn't really done so well. You know, we had succeeded in the basics, but on that other level, you know, that really deep kind of healing level, um, I, I hadn't really done yet. Um, and so I think, you know, <laughs> that's what matters to me, and that's something that I try to work on every day. And, you know, in a way, some of the higher level stuff is easier to do, you know, to push through a bill or to create an organization.
taxation or to buy a house and save people to come move in or to help people get food or benefits, you know. Those things in some ways are easier to do. Because it's not until people uh, make that shift inside and, and feel that they have power and they are respected and they do belong. And that's where the real change happens. Yeah, so thank you so much for that. Um, one of the things I wanted to kind of take a step back a little bit and talk about um, how you came to those conclusions, how, how you decided to know what, what mattered to you. Um, and I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about um, maybe your formative years, how, how you think that, that your formative years have really affected um, the way that you act today. So what it was like um, when you were college students age, what you, what you were thinking about, um, what you were doing, um, and when you had your aha moment that you were going to fight for things that you just talked about. I don't know. You know, I'd love to hear from other people about this too. I, I don't know if there's any one moment, you know. I mean people you know, um, I kind of you know, I believe that there's more than one lifetime, you know, and that you have this work for many, many lifetimes. So but you, you know, you, you're less clear about um, So, you, you know, in, uh, I think that Buddhism in, in that, the whole idea is that um, beings come into the world for the sole purpose of being their brothers. And that they kind of take a vow that um, as long as. Has, has, you know, do you think your, um, how has your, your studies um, really affected the way that you go to your studies and things like that? Well, you know, the studies are more just like the other levels. You know, studies are just studies. You know? It's just what you're able to do with it, you know, when you're in the world and you're with other people. I mean, you know, Bernie made a great statement the other day. Somebody asked him about his religion, you know, and he said, you know, I believe that we're connected. Um, and, but you know, you get, you grow up in a culture and, and you're afraid. Let's say you grow up and, um, you know, you're afraid that you're going to lose what you have. And you're afraid of other people that are different than you. And so people, pl that plays into this fear and you don't have a bigger fear about um, how to bring people together or, you know, how people could be seen as being dependent or interdependent upon each other. And so, uh, you know, I had this, this great discussion with this friend of mine. He's a Buddhist. He teaches at um, Columbia. He's a professor there. And uh, I went and stayed with him uh, on September 11th, happened to be. We went up on the rooftop of this building and we saw, you know, they had the, everything lit up, the, you know, the monuments the, and the whole nine yards. And then we went out to dinner and we had this amazing discussion, you know. And I told him we were taking this family from. Iran, that they were coming to the shelter. And he said, I don't know how I feel about that. I said, why not? He said, well, I'm Jewish, you know. I grew up on a kibbutz in Israel. I'm afraid. I'm afraid of people. You know, I'm afraid of, pe of people, if somebody's walking around with a burqa, are they going to blow me up, you know, in Central Park? You know, and I grew up with this fear. And so, I don't know what I think about this. I don't really know if I want all these people to come. And I said, but Bill, you know, this is this is a family that's lost their home. They've got two little kids. You know, they, they face death. You know, what are you going to do? Well, it's a bottomless pit. How can we help them all? There's so many of them. You know, so I said, well, it's not a bottomless pit. I mean, a child curled up on the beach is not a bottomless pit. It's a child. It's a five-year-old child. So we have this discussion with our friends and with ourselves, right? We have these discussions with ourselves. And, um, you know, one day we take one side and the next day we take the other side. And it really is kind of a process. I think um, 
one of the things that you spoke about in your TED talk that you gave was about the, the egoism <coughs> behind activism and how everything yeah. becomes a prop. And I think there's a lot of people in the room here who are really interested in social change and um, social justice and activism and things like that. And I was hoping you could maybe talk a little bit about yeah. um, your experiences with that and kind of the conclusions that you've come to because of that. Yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting thing, you know, because when you're involved in activism, you know, your cause is an extension of yourself, you know, and then you kind of get, I mean, you know, I'm addicted to the election, and I watch it, all of it, and I'm on all the listservs, and, you know, just because I was in politics, you know, it's, but, you know, a lot of people are, and, and it just becomes, you know, you post something, Somebody responds, and like I, there's a young woman. She was she grew up in Orwell. I knew her since she was a young girl, and uh, she's supporting Hillary Clinton. And she's in the legislature now. You know, I was very proud to see her grow up and kind of take this. And, you know, she's a, for all the good things. And you know, we're friends on Facebook, and I posted something, and you know, very about poverty and you know, different issues. Well, she she wrote back and she said, sometimes I'm even afraid, it, actually this is in some days, I'm even afraid to post anything I believe because people are so uh, strong-willed about their views. And I felt really badly, you know, because maybe it was like something, I'm sure I wasn't the only one that had posted something very emphatically with a lot of, you know, some research behind it and things, you know, and she just kind of felt, wow, that's not the way I see it, you know. And yeah, this is someone that was just kind of, kind of just like me, you know what I mean? And, I, and then I had to stop and think, and I would never want her to feel that way. And so you know there's a certain amount of ego sometimes when you're taking, whenever you're taking a position, you know, it's my view, it's my cop. It's my shelter, it's my legislation, it's my candidate, you know. This is how I feel. And uh, I'm not saying it's bad, but it's really something to look at, you know. It's, uh, it's really, uh, it, everything becomes a polemic. And your life can become a polemic. And then you're not bringing any peace to any other person. You're not doing that that one on one where the real shift happens. You know? So I think the real, you know, and, and you watch somebody like Donald Trump on TV and you think, oh, brother. But you know, there's no listening going on. You know, you're always rebutting or po posing another. Mm -hmm. So. So these are questions that one asks better sooner than later. I mean, you don't want to get to be like my age and realize that your whole life has been a big battle, you know? And that you might have some things to, to your credit, you might have passed some legislation, you might have started some organizations, you might have built some houses, but how have you really been as far as the interdependent relationships that people have bringing about justice, bringing about peace, bringing about change. They don't come through force. Now, um, if you could talk a little bit about your your work at the at the at the shelter at John Grant Housing Services, what it's been like for you. Um, you've been there for how many years now? About eleven or twelve. Um, and what your kind of transformation as being the director of the shelter has been. Um, what your outlook on things from when you first came into the shelter and what they are now. What things do you feel most proud of? <laughs> well, um, you know, it, it, it's not great to feel that proud of. I mean, you know, there's probably a lot of things that everyone does that you don't really know made a difference to somebody, you know? Um, so those are the things that you don't even know what they are. You know, one time I uh, I was campaigning in front of the post office down in Brandon. And uh, so, 
you know, you just stand there and you say, hi, you know, my name's Elizabeth Reedy, I'm your senator, I'm running for re-election, put out your hand. You know? Some people say, oh, hi, you know, and, or whatever, good morning, you know, want a coffee, whatever. So I was standing there doing that and this woman came up <clears throat> and I said, hi, you know, my name's, I could see she was a little reticent and uh, I'm running for re-election and she just looked at me. And I thought, oh, okay, there's something wrong here. I've done something that she doesn't like. You know, that's what I thought. And uh, she says, I know who you are. So I said, okay. I just waited. And she said, um, my daughter was 16 years old when she was raped. And I called you. And uh, you got her to be able to go to the Bradbury retreat. And now she's 21. And uh, that's all she said. And then she just walked away. But I could tell that seeing me reminded her of it. You know what I mean? And, you know, I was very happy to be, have been able to get her in. But it wasn't about me getting her in. I never even knew what went on. You know, she was trying to kill herself. And uh, so, you know, that's the thing is, is you don't really know. And then when I met her, she wasn't happy at all to see me, you know. I mean, it was just like, oh, you know, there's that person that I talked to that night, that awful night, the worst night of my life, you know, with the mother. So, you know, it's, it's weird things like that that you think about, you know, you don't even know how many times something like that happens. Yeah, you can, you know, if I was to point to a bill, maybe I would point to the energy efficiency bill that created the energy efficiency utility for first in the nation. You know, that's, that looks great. You could make a speech about it. You know, you wouldn't want to make a speech about the other, you know, about it. But that's kind of how it is, you know. It's kind of fraught, you know. You try to do, you try to work with somebody. It's not that one did anything great, but, you know, it's just like there's so much suffering. You look over your shoulder and everything's back. So. Conversely, what would you what would you say uh, that you are most afraid of? Um, most afraid of? Yeah. Well, I don't know. I think it's really interesting to look at one's fears. You know, I, I'm really afraid of flying, and I'm afraid of um, I'm going to Bhutan on October. And I'm really afraid of the roads in Bhutan. If you ever go online and look at them. Has anybody been? No. And uh, I think about what is that fear about? What is that? Well, you know, my father was in World War II. And uh, he was shot down a couple times. He was, he was a kid that grew up in Burlington. He really loved his community. And, loved the state and the country was very patriotic. But you know, uh, he suffered a great deal in the war. He was really damaged by the war. Um, and you know, he never, he was kind of, you know, he had the Purple Hearts and the Silver Cross or whatever they are. And, but he never talked about it as that generation didn't much, you know. But you know, I carry his fear. Um, I carry the fear that he had shot down in New Guinea. And I carry, I think, also somewhat of the karma of the wars of this country. And that's what I'm the most afraid of. Um, I'm afraid of them. You know, I've tried to overcome those fears, but I realize I have them because, you know, we have created a lot of terror in the world. And, you know, I carry that terror. In, you know. And so, you know, I just hate to think about any more of it being created, you know, and any more people having to carry it, you know. I mean, I've lived a really nice life here in Vermont, or really I've been anywhere else, you know. But just to have to carry all of that fear and all of that subtle body angst about all the things that have happened. Would you say, um, with all of the 
the crazy things that are happening around us? Would you say that you're optimistic towards the future? Um, well, you know, there's this, you know, I don't need to keep talking about Buddhism. It's only just kind of a way of seeing the world. It's not even really a religion, but there's, um, there's this one little teaching that says that, pe that all beings are moving inexorably toward life. You know, and, you know, whatever you think enlightenment is, it would be freedom from suffering. It doesn't mean that you don't get sick. It just means that, you know, you don't have the heavy suffering of the ego. So, you know, and I think that kind of goes back to how do you keep going? back and they're all back. It's that same kind of, um, you know, that the universe in some way is of infinite energy and that that energy is a positive energy, as Martin Luther King said in you know, the arc of history. I don't you know if you use the word inexorably, but toward justice and toward goodness. And toward. So yeah, in that sense, it doesn't mean that there isn't tremendous suffering. But out of that suffering, I think, comes the ability to um, make some other choices. I think um, probably my last question that I have um, is kind of taking it back to what matters to you and if you could tell us what, what your vision, what the vision of what the vision of your perfect community and your the world that you strive towards, what that is? Well, this is it, you know, right here. You know, where you have just have people that are each trying in their own way to um, really realize you know, the, their best values. And, you know, I don't think it doesn't look utopian in any way. I, I don't think that it has any particular shape or, you know, I, I just think it, it has to do with realizing the interdependence that we have and trying to um, trying to realize it on all different levels. I, I know that's not a very Powerful uh, I don't think it. I don't think it would be. I don't think it's anything like. I'm gonna create it. You know. I'm gonna. It looks like this. I. I think it's gonna look different for every person. You know that. There's this this idea that existence is primordially perfect. You know, the order of the universe is just so magnificent that in any given moment, you could realize that in your life. You know, I, I know that kind of, that sounds like a lot to just say in a kind of an informal luncheon. So I don't think it looked any different than it does now. Thank you so much, Sam. Yeah, what do you guys think? We'll open it to a Q&A, so. Feel free to ask questions. <coughs> Doesn't have to be a question. It be an assertion. <laughs> I, um, I really enjoy the reflection about, you know, what does it mean to be exhausted? And maybe you're physically exhausted, but your purpose is still there, so you're not exhausted about that purpose. Yeah. Um, but I'm trying to think more, like my mom has always been, involved with uh, indigenous rights back home. Mm -hmm. And I remember growing up sort of seeing how sometimes that affected my relationship with her in a way because for her there was a bigger issue and yeah, yeah. Yeah. sometimes you had to go to a meeting instead of going to like family lunch kind of deal. Um, yeah. And then toward the end that affected her health. Um, but, like you could see sort of like just being exhausted a lot of the time. Yeah. Um, and she kept doing it, she's still doing it, there has been like a lot of amazing work. Um, so I'm trying to balance 
the idea of being physically exhausted versus that purpose. And I guess part of me wanted to hear more about that because I don't think it completely fulfilled the idea or I don't know, it didn't satisfy like Yeah, how would you how would you do it? How would you continue to have the concerns that she had and to work toward it? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I guess like I see her work and I'm inspired by it and now I'm sort of more interested in what she's doing, so it's not until I was like what, 22 that I appreciated mm -hmm. what she did in the past, but as a kid I would remember like, oh yeah, you promised we would go out for dinner and then it did not happen. Oh, yeah. um, so just, yeah, that balance between your... Well, you know, that's exactly why I got into this whole other way of thinking mm. about it, you know. I was at my son's house last night and he said almost the exact same thing mm. as you said. I remember calling you up, Mom, when dog got porcupine quills, and I called you at the state house. And I was a little boy, and I said, what do I do? And you said, sit down on the dog and pull him out one by one. <laughs> you know, like, you know, I wasn't there. You know, I wasn't there. Like, most kids would, you know, their mother would come in and say, okay, you know, we're going to take the dog yeah. out of that. You know, that was, you know, it was just like, I didn't even remember it. You know, I was probably too busy. I didn't even know that there was this little kid with his dog. You know, it was horrible. I, I felt I didn't feel terrible all day today about that. Actually. Mm -hmm. And you know, I just wasn't I wasn't aware. You know, I wasn't aware about all. You know, and I just got exhausted all the time, and I just worked till I dropped. So I think you really have to look at that, um, and you really have to look at. You know, I do meditation in a very serious way, but, you know, I've only been doing it since I was probably, only since I was 50. I should have been doing it since I started. But it doesn't have to be meditation. It could be whatever it is for you that allows you to, I mean, if you really believe in the interdependence of, you know, whether it's like reading, you know, Emerson or Thoreau or indigenous, philosophy, um, creation, or whatever it is, you know, you've got to get in touch with that energy so that you can be really present, you know, yeah. um, and I'm sure your mother was really trying really hard to, you know, she had a vision, and she had an open heart, and she gave whatever she had toward it, you know, but I think where we really fall back is, um, is in not, you know, not realizing the other side of it, you know, the side that isn't just political and it just, um, you know, I hate to talk too much because I don't want to sound kind of like just like I'm just talking about my own path, mm -hmm. you know what I mean, because I don't think it's any better than anyone else's, but I think it's essential to have that energy that wind at your back and whatever work you're doing. Because otherwise it's just ego. Mm -hmm. Otherwise it's just one little person, one smart person, one big person, one powerful person. But you don't have that, you know, you don't have the righteousness of the universe with you when you're just battling every day in little battles. You know, I think. Um, but I, I you know, I, I hate that. You know, I could talk personally about my own path, but it wouldn't necessarily be the yeah. right one for you. You know what I mean? But I'm sure you you know what it is, right? Mm -hmm. Or you can figure that out. Mm -hmm. Other people have other ideas about that. And so yeah, I my thinking goes along some of the lines. Um, and although I agree with you that everybody needs to find their own path towards accessing the positivity of that energy. To me as a young person, it's just very it's very curious to know about someone who has found a way for themselves to, to manage to do that. Um, so what I'm curious and what I would love to hear a little bit more about is if you if you're confronted with a lot of negative emotions on a daily basis, 
where do they go? What, what do you do with them? Like, how do you maintain that access to, to that energy? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, that's true, you know? I mean, it's really hard. It's really, really hard, you know? Uh, um, well, I have a spiritual practice. It's a meditation practice. And the whole idea behind it is, you know, that you, the idea is that you can drop through all of those things. You can let them go, but they're not any more than thoughts. And that if you train your mind to do that, ultimately you come to a place that um, is vivid, vividly present. And very peaceful and very powerful. And um, a lot of these other things, including one's own past activities, fail. You know what I mean? Like this morning I was in this fight with this other agency about getting a homeless woman's back debt paid off. And they won't accept any kind of deal. And the family's been homeless for two years because they have this back. And so we're just fighting with, you know, and I just, you know, I'm just, it's wrong, I think it's immoral, I'm angry about it. You know, but I also know that, you know, that's my thing, you know, that's what I do is I get into a fight with people, you know, and I just take somebody's side and I create, you know, it might be a righteous battle, but, you know, it's a battle. And it's at great personal expense. And so, you know, you just, I've even, I've even done these sneaky things like get other people to take the fight, you know? <laughs> you know I mean, because you know, you realize a fight is a fight. A battle is a battle. It's got all the same, whether it's a righteous one or not, you know? And so you just, then you just look at those, you know, they say if you look directly at that anger, or at that fear, that beneath that is this wellspring of, you know, that, that doesn't have concept, that doesn't have, and that, that that's the place from which you can really, you know, make the right decision. But, you know, it, it's really interesting because, the two, you know, it's really hard to do, but it's a practice. It's just like if you're sitting and talking to a homeless person that's been through hell and you have a lot of suggestions for them. The right thing isn't to offer those suggestions. So you just have to be. So it's just a practice at every and every moment. You know, what would be the most benefit here? I just had a question about um, what presence means to you and what it looks like to you and how you cultivate that. Like, do you have practices for us to be able to use in our daily life in order to be present with people? Well, I'm not very good at it. Um, I'm really not, and I'm not saying that in any kind of a facetious way. I mean, I have enough awareness to know that I don't have much awareness. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I just think I've been smart enough to um, for, for me in the shelter, I have just hire people that are good at it. Yeah, and then, and then you know, um, there are a lot of things about being present. I mean, we just did a training. You know, they're the usual things about, you know, put away the gadgets, you know, you face the person. Eye contact. You're not afraid of silence. Um, you know, if someone's telling you something that's incredibly painful, you know, that you're not afraid to hear it. You're not trying to change it. Um, you know, I had a woman that came to us from jail. <laughs> 
and she was a really violent person. She wanted to, she always wanted to kill people. You know? She was, and we used to talk a lot, and I, I would real, I could really relate to it, you know, to how she was. She's kind of like me in a way because she would see something and it would strike her as wrong, you know, and she would become angry. But she didn't have any boundaries and she didn't have the power to channel them. So one day I was talking with her, she, and she started to tell me about some, this person, some person that she wanted to kill. And uh, she started to talk about it, and uh, all of a sudden she was shaking and she was weeping. I'm, I'm not suggesting people do this necessarily, but this is somebody I knew for 20 years. And so I just listened to her, you know, listened to her talk about it. And, you know, I mentioned to her that it seemed to me like what was really at the bottom of all of it was that she really loved this person. Yeah. Um, and that she really loved this person and whatever happened, it didn't work out, you know. It wasn't the way it should have been. And I said, you know, if you can just kind of stay in that place where you, of that vulnerability where you just love that person. And just kind of stay there and not be afraid. Um, and we used to we used to do that sometimes, you know. Like I don't know if if, if if other people have ever done that, but if you often have a strong emotion or a strong conviction, sometimes if you get under it, and you can just kind of see where it comes from, you know. And you can just kind of like even that woman I was telling you about that I was fighting for the deposit. Uh, you know, for the money, to, so she could, you know, if I really look underneath it, I just, you know, it's just that vulnerability of that whole family. That, uh, you know, it's just, if you let yourself just kind of feel that, and then you, then a better solution might come, you know what I mean? not so easy to do at the moment. You know? But there's a lot of chance to learn about how your own mind works and how your own, you know, like for me, when I hear about something like that, it's almost like immediate, okay, you know, already you're saddling up, you're going to do something, you know, and it's not always the right impulse. Or it's one impulse. <laughs> Might not be the wrong impulse, but it's one, you know. I just wanted to thank you for the point that you just made about vulnerability and kind of getting beneath the, the noise and the reactivity um, because it, I've been thinking a lot about the connections between larger issues and you know, interpersonal relationships and how related those um, conversations I think are, you know, as we look at you know, our political debates and then we look at the way that we treat one another in smaller communities, and I think that that to me is just a really important thing to remember, just like the threads that run through uh, the different conversations that we have in seemingly different spaces. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's very, I mean, I wish I had known that when I was your age. I mean, is you know, you create a lot of suffering for yourself and others trying to solve these problems mm -hmm. without that, yeah. you know? It, it just can sometimes seem, I think, as, you know, from other conversations I've had with people in this room, that looking ahead to leaving a place like Middlebury, it feels overwhelming oftentimes to look at just how complicated things seem um, in the wider world and feeling you know, really inspired to act on things that you know, I think are unjust, but then also feeling just the weight of everything. <laughs> well, you know, though, what you can do, what, that's a really good point, you know. Um, what you can do is you can create a little microcosm. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. sometimes I think we've tried to do that at the shelter, you know, mm -hmm. where you can bring people together. They, and people aren't all the same. 
Okay. You know, you, you might have old people, young people, you know, people from different backgrounds, different races. You know, you bring people together and you create something. You know, you create a place that's safe. You know, it's safe for you, it's safe mm -hmm. for them, and it's safe for the people that you're there to serve. Right. So, you know, like maybe like with your mother, you know, I mean, if she had people, you know, and then it, it becomes a source of, of strength and power, mm -hmm. not just not just because you're housing people or you're creating rights or you're, you know, whatever it is, but it also just, be, like sometimes I go to these meetings, battles. For, like we just had this battle, 15% for the homeless. So the idea is that 15% of all probably funded housing should go to people that are homeless. Well, it was a terrible battle. And the people that were, that owned housing, they're nonprofit people. They have good views. You know, why am I fighting with them? And then, you know, sometimes you just, I would often think, oh, I can't wait to go back to the shelter. You know? where you kind of almost set a standard about how people would be treated. And you can create those all over the place. You know, if everybody here goes out in their life and creates something, it doesn't have to be big. It could be a family. It could be an organization. You know, it could be a school. You know, it could be a movement. You know, like what Bernie's doing or like any, you know, it could be, you know, where people can support each other and have common values. And so you can definitely do that. I mean, I've seen enough people, you know, we have these Shepherd Poverty interns um, that um, the end was one. And now we've probably had 10, you know. And um, I know, I keep in touch with most of them. You know, and one woman uh, that was here, her name is Meg, and you know, she, went on got her master's in counseling and she's running a shelter for women. Uh, another guy, um, Alex is a diplomat. Uh, he's doing uh, some you know work in Africa. And so you know you go out and you you can create a, a little place you know, that will be beneficial. You know, I always say and I always tell the people in the shelter when you, whenever you're up against the situation, always just ask yourself, what serves here? And allow the space for the answer to come to you. Whether it's with a client or an organizational decision, you know, what serves? And really ask it with an open heart, you know? And, and it, you know, that wisdom mind that you have will help you answer it. So, you for one last question. Um, I am curious because I hear the word battle being used a lot. Yeah. And, um, I also really respect that it sounds like you're also looking for a different way through your meditation, through yeah. Buddhist philosophy. Yeah. How, in your estimation, um, is that the only way to interact with the system? Has the system changed during the course of your career? Um, how does battle fit into the whole paradigm of how we're going to get from point A to point B, whatever? I mean, there's lots of different opinions in the world, so different points A and point Bs. Uh, well, yeah, you know, I mean, that's kind of my personal challenge, you know. I mean, I try to lessen the battle. And, um, you know, but the bottom line is, if I was to really look at it, you know, I still believe in it in some way, you know. I still think it's the right way to go, you know, even though, I, you know, I talk about carrying a subtle body fear of it, you know. There's some kind of, it's not, that, that mechanism isn't broken in me. I still want to make the fight, you know. So I'm just working on it, you know. I mean, you just have to constantly just say in every single juncture what serves. What would be the best approach here? How, you know, how would it benefit? So, is that what you're asking? I guess I'm just curious whether, in the course of your career, I mean, yes, that's a wonderful answer, and and maybe an addendum would be, in the course of your career, has 
battle become more pointed or less, you know, is it less for me? You know, for less for you and in general? Oh, in, in the world? Is it always a battle? Is there, do you ever see places where no, that's you can the, come to consensus without a battle? Right, exactly. That's what I think is the point of it. You know? But you're seeing someone that is kind of fraught with it. You know what I mean? I can see intellectually that what you're saying is the case. But I have, you know, we, I don't know how we can really have peace until we can bring it about in ourselves. You know, I think that's what I'm talking about. It's a lifelong effort to do that. At first, you try to do it on the outside. You know, there's this whole thing, which, you, as you may know, you know, like when you do visualization, you know, the good, the wisdom mind is outside of you. It's not you. You know, you're creating it. You're you're ramping it up. You know, you're creating a view of a world or of a deity or of some kind of goodness. There it is. You ramp it up. You cultivate it, and you bring it about. But ultimately, that's what one does inside. You know that 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 the that wisdom mind, that kindness, that gentleness, what serves that, and then it's all pervasive. But for me, you know, you can see where I'm at. <laughs> you know, I'm still trying really hard to make the world right. You know, instead of necessarily having. But I'm also say, saying to other people, don't take that route. <laughs> you know, and it's great that you're doing that. You're seeing that, you know, at the beginning of your career, and you'll you'll have a lot more leading with that. Thank you so much, Elizabeth.